we are waking up to this stuff, but we're a little bit behind. A lot of us are behind the curveball in comparison to where you guys are. And that's one of the big reasons, but it's great having you here just to show people here that we're still firmly stuck in the sending the three letter process templates, that kind of stuff. And what Damien and I are really passionate about is promoting litigation, learn your rights, do this stuff properly. The courts are here for us too. me gavin and damien my name is brandon sibley known on the youtube and the interwebs as the big sib i started out my journey just like everyone else a random question it's a spiritual thing that transpired where i asked a question and and i didn't know who i was asking it to at, at the time right i was completely agnostic pro probably cl close to atheist fulfilling the desires of the flesh and things of that nature but one day i walked outside and i remember Something's just not right in this world. And I didn't even, know, I had never, I wasn't raised in the church. I wasn't raised any way like that. And I just looked up and I said, God, if you're real, reveal things to me and I'll follow it. I just knew something in my soul that something was wrong with the world that I was living in. And things didn't make sense. Now, to back up, at this time, I was had been released uh, from five years of prison this time because I rejected society in its whole, in all its forms, machinations, and I rejected authority on all points. As a very young man at 16, I went to prison and then five years later I got out. But something never made sense to me. It, it, none of it made sense. And I didn't have the cognitive abilities to articulate it, but that's when the path started. And so we'll fast forward some years. I got into 9-11. I realized that something was really wrong with 9-11. I started moving into biblical knowledge and things of that nature. And around 10 years ago or so, I started getting into avenues of the law. And of course, there's so much misinformation, malinformation, and disinformation on law and the ease and simplicity of the law, which we'll discuss later today in this episode, was that you attach yourself to religious beliefs, and theoretical presumptions and assumptions, because they sound good. A good orator or a good circumstantial evidence can lead you to believe something that isn't true. And it happened to me also. I went through the UCC stuff and the secret CQB trust and all these other things. And I wasted like four and a half years on non-consequential information. However, with all things, it was necessary to be able to see the lines. Again, as you get through and you start applying real principles, first principles and rules and procedure, and you understand this simple statement that I'm going to say right here. And, and if everyone can incorporate this into their uh, vocabulary and their thought processes, rules and scientific methods can be objective. No man can be objective. That's why we stick to rules, procedures, and law, because they are unchangeable. The principles to them are changing. Every man, woman, or child on this earth has some form of confirmation bias. Therefore, we use the rules and the procedure to get to the objective truth. That's really well said, actually. Yeah. I, mean, I think that's Brilliant. perfectly capped off there. I'm interested to know, because I've watched some of your stuff here, like, that. The first case that you actually got into, the, and I want to say you, we've all gone through that journey of the Sesco B Trust and everything. So it's quite interesting that you guys do that too. It's, you, it's almost like a rite of passage. It's the training. You've got to go through it. And I think it, it, it does, for me, it sharpens research skills, but then you do get to the realization that's not going to get you anywhere. You've got to start taking it seriously. So I'm interested in the first case that you, you got into, like how did it come about and how did it go? Like what were the big lessons learned through that? So the very first case that I filed was against Walmart. And if anybody goes back four years into my YouTube channel, I single-handedly, and, and I say single-handedly, it was me and uh, Gary. I single-handedly opened every store back up in my immediate area. That, that includes Rouse's, uh, 
Walmarts and everything else. As soon as they did the mask mandate, uh, I went around uh, with uh, the public accommodation laws and forced my way into these places without a mask. And one of the places that uh, led me out by gunpoint uh, was Walmart on O'Neill Lane. And when they did that, I sued them. However, I sued them with a bunch of gobbledygook. I didn't even have a cause of action that I had all the essential elements pled correctly. But what I did was finally say, okay, I've had enough of this garbage. And the moment that the suit hit the federal district court and I had one hearing with the judge. And at that time, I had been really researching communism, Marxism. I was reading Hegel and trying to understand, really grasp the Hegelian dialectics and under, trying to grasp how these psychopaths think. So when I got into the first hearing and I could, by evidence and by experience, notice that the judge was what I would call a judicial activist now, right? Practicing purposivism. And it, if anybody looked that word up, you put that into your vocabulary also. However, after that episode, it was 12B1 and 6 dismissed out of court because I had failed to state a claim for which the court could grant relief. And so that really bothered me. And if I can tell anybody out there, never let curiosity leave you. Never accept what is presented to you as facts. Continue digging deeper. And when you hit failure, don't think that that's it, everything's over. Because it's not. You're just beginning, beginning a new chapter of life. And without that failure in federal court, that really, it ignited something within me. Something was wrong. I read the opinion from the judge, and I said, okay, Brandon, there's a direct cause and effect here. I brought the law inside Walmarts. Everybody else at this time, when it was dismissed, everybody else across the country and where my dad was and everyone else was still forced to wear masks. The little thing I did by bringing the law inside my, all my local places here, had them put an asterisk on the sign. And I don't know if y'all remember this or not, but, and I don't know if y'all had it over there, but in, in the United States anyway, when they first came out with the mask mandates, all signs said you must. After about a two or three month period, they put an asterisk at the bottom, unless me medically or religiously exempt. <laughs> And what that was people like me going to all these places and saying, you, you're violating the law. So I knew at that point that something was wrong within my methodology. And so instead of blaming the world and becoming the perpetual victim and saying it's everybody else's fault, uh, I instead looked within and said, okay, I'm going to humble myself. I'm curious. I want to know. And it's about that time that I was introduced to Dr. Graves' course, Jurisdictionary, and I went after it hard. And I took the course seven times in a matter of three weeks. That's the typical wow. way that That's I impressive. Trust <laughs> uh, <laughs> my Two notebooks still right here that I keep with all my notes that I took during the course. And what happened was I understood that the modern education system was intentionally dumbing us down. I grasped that we had zero knowledge of how our courts work or how our government's supposed to work. And once I was done with that class, I was like, okay, now I can apply something. Now I can articulate when I read a statute, how to actually break it down into its essential elements and what needs to be pled effectively to be able to state a claim which the court can grant relief. So over here, we're obviously affiliated with Dr. Graves' course too. And for me, it's, it was the game change. It was like the thing that, that it was almost like the fog lifted. Once I got into that, it was like, you, you could see the pathway forward. And so there's a lot of people out here that are just starting the journey. And we get a lot of questions about the course, is it worth it and that. So obviously you've had a positive experience about it. How important for you, was that course in your current success now? Oh, Do you uh, wouldn't be where I, without it. Yeah, no, because it was so simple. And see, one of the things that social engineers have done is hide behind complexity. Um, 
So they make every subject so complex and so hypothetical and so theoretical that we go off into random equations and everything else and we get lost in the complexity. Uh, but the truth is simple. It's the lie that is complex. And so the simplicity of Dr. Graves' course, and of course, me, Dr. Graves and I are good friends. At this point, because I had stood up on my first principles during COVID, I already had the spiritual backbone already. There was no way anybody on this God's green earth was going to forcibly vaccinate me or forcibly amass me. They would have had to stuff me into a hole to do. And uh, that was a good part too, because I had re reached that point. And this is something to uh, explain to people too. Once you reach a point to where you're principally living, you can't be moved off that rock. You're not on the shores with the sand. You're on top of the rock and you, your feet shone with the light, right? And you're like, no way. And it's a shock to conscience, right? Because if that your choices, your intentions, and your thoughts and how they correlate to your neighbor and do unto others as you would have to do unto you, you, under, you would grasp that you cannot physically compel or career so, somebody without it being a criminal act. So once, once, once you started going through the common law and you understood that it, it was just an articulation of spiritual principles into written words so we could have a civil society, I understood it. It was simple. It was okay. And so from there, I could go off and I could study Thomas Jefferson, Frederick Bastot, Thomas Reed, a, another great a Scottish philosopher, John Locke in theory. And I could see wow. where that information that was being articulated during the, what's called the Enlightenment period was so different. It was transformative because for thousands of years, man had lived in a collectivist uh, a state where the state or a monarchy had ruled with an iron fist in some form, fashion, or other. And yet the constitutional republic that was created in America was a beacon for the rest of the world in that it's same in Britain too, in England, and this enlightenment period come from these guys saying that the absolute rights are in the individual and not the state. And so when I started applying those principles with the common law, we can juxtapose that on our current reality. How did they get rid of our common law? They put administrative law, rules, regulations for commercial entities on top of it. And yes, people are right um, in that they've turned you into a commercial instrument. It's, it's not necessarily, they've just hidden it behind vagueness and ambiguity. And, and I'll do a quote. Let me bring it from my head if I can. Uh, Thomas Reed, the Scottish philosopher, uh, stated there's no greater impediment to the advancement of knowledge than the ambiguity of words. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, really true. Which is why um, when Brandon did a, a video seminar on the rules of language and statutory construction, that was a game changer for me personally, because what you've just quoted there is synonymous with that, where you can remove the ambiguity. You can remove the judge's prejudice, the bias perhaps against you because you say, no, this is what is written. This is what it says. Could I ask you, Brandon, could you elaborate some more with regards to your learning journey with Scalia and, and Ghana? Could I possibly ask you? Oh, yes. And so if anybody from here, as a matter of fact, I just did episode two on the legal beagles. You'll enjoy it, Damien. The episode's going to be called The Art of, of Language. And so somewhere about maybe two years ago, maybe three years ago, I really went into watching Scalia. He had about 10 YouTube videos over the years, hour-long excerpts at different colleges and churches. He was a stout Catholic, by the way. But I started watching those and I started digging further and further into Scalia and how he was the first originalist and textualist on the Supreme Court in 30 years. And what that did was bring me to a book I probably spent, I don't know, 60, 70 hours listening to Scalia. And he did an interview where he talked about the rules of interpretation, reading the law, a matter of interpretation. And he went through a few of the canons, like the associated meanings canon and the plain ordinary language canon, which is the golden rule. And 
what I did was I instantly went and found the book. I bought it. And what we had within the telegram groups, when I got this information, cause I was the first one to, to actually find it and start sharing it with everybody in the groups, it started making exact sense when the freedom health defense fund was the first people to beat the CDC. And I'll give everybody an example. The CDC is statutory directive is to have power and authority over fumigation, cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting. Okay. That's the actual list of words there. However, uh, what the CDC did was try to go back and say that it had the authority to sanitize people instead of things. Oh. And so the court case was Freedom Health Defense Fund versus CDC. We're somewhere around 2000, late 2021, 22. And I read the judge's opinion and the judge uses the rules of interpretation to direct that the CDC had overstepped its administrative authority and he started breaking down the rules of interpretation. And I was like, okay. All right, now we're getting somewhere. And, and then I would read uh, another judge's opinion who didn't use any of the rules of interpretation, but would protect the FDA or something, right? Because that's a judicial activist. The only way that the rule of law actually works if it, is if all rules apply generally to everyone in the society, okay? It is unfortunate. It, it, I, I'm just going to pontificate on this, this thread here because I don't want people to think I'm a sunshine pumper or uh, I'm running around here uh, with a cloud over my head, uh, shaking unicorn dust off. That's not the truth. Let me tell you where we really are. The social engineers and the collectivists, the Marxists, the protectionists, and the socialists have been hard at work for 80 years while the rest of us normal folk who are not degenerate and depraved have been fast asleep at the wheel. So they've infiltrated, subverted every institution our family, right? Our schools, our media, our law, and whatever other institute education, right? They've infiltrated them all and they're all pushing, I guess it's left. I don't, I don't really know, but here it's the left because in America, Hitler would be on the right in Europe, but in America, he's on the left because the complete right in America is anarchy. And right next to it is anarcho-capitalism. So everything that's socialist is way on the left in America. That's, it doesn't matter if you go from Nietzscheism, Marxism, or Foucault, or Paulo Freire, whichever one of these psychopaths that they follow, Hume, Heidinger, Kant, it, it, it's on and on. It's all the same thing. That objective reality doesn't exist. All we have is our interpretations and things of that nature. But anyway. I digress there. I got a little off track, but nonetheless, what I was, what I had stumbled upon with Scalia was that objective facts did matter. Okay. And that the rules of grammar when applied would come out with an even handed judgment more often than not. Look, you're always going to have issues because men are fallible. Right. There is no utopia here as long as mankind's here. So anybody looking for a utopia or a perfect system, you're never going to find it. You got the fallible man here. So if there's always going to be criminals, there's always going to be psychopaths. We must stand against it. So it was Scalia in his book, Matter, Reading the Law, Matter of Interpretation, that opened up. It was like Pandora's box because I'm reading Scal Scalia and he's got all these great cases quoted in here. He's got a simplistic explanation of how the law is supposed to work. And here I was, just like the rest of you out there, I've been tr uh, chasing the perpetual dog's tail, looking in the UCC trust and everything else. And here was the simplicity of our legal system, which requires that the judicial branch is an independent and unbiased agency. That way we can walk into the courts, exercise our fundamental liberties, and have ju uh, judgments rendered according to the law, not to uh, a, a judge's wishes, whims, inclinations, or fears too, because I mean, many judges are fearful to rule against the government at this point. But anyway, I, I, I hope that explains that a little bit better. I mean, you can ask something there. Or... Brilliant. Can I I'll just go back to a point that Brandon made? 
I, Brandon, I did, in, I did indeed watch the Walmart saga, and I can't believe four years has flown by. I watched that. And let me say now, that gave me the confidence, the heart, to do exactly the same thing, to challenge the security, to challenge the people trying to mask my sacred breath of life. And it gave me the confidence, the tenacity to deal with it. I'd just like to say thank you for that. I did see, because I, I believe you filmed it as well, didn't you? You, you were there with your wife and uh, your children. Was, was that yeah. great? Yes. And that was the end of my YouTube channel, by the way. Was it? Was it? <laughs> I mean that by saying I was averaging 60. If, you, if people d decide to go back, you'll see up until that point, I averaged 30 to 60,000 views per video. And... So not only did I do the Walmart video, I did Rouse's video and another Walmart where I, they kicked me out the first day, escorted me with guns. And then the second day I had got in touch with corporate law, uh, lawyers uh, for Walmart. And then I went back in and recorded the people that kicked me out. Hey, I'm back in here mass free. And again, that cost me a lot because that's misinformation on Google. Do no evil. But you inspired so many through your courage. I'm glad to be a vessel for that. And it was scary. Let's be honest. It, it was. When you're facing somebody with a gun and it, they're using physical compulsion and coercion to forcibly remove you from somewhere that you have every legal right to be for something as stupid. And this is, this is what really bothered me with it. Because if you were tuned in for years, for the last 20 years here in America, we've laughed at the Chinese for wearing masks because they don't work, right? And then all of a sudden, all they had to do was flip a switch and say, oh, you know, it works now. What? No, it's <laughs> illogical, uh, unreasonable, and irrational. It's no way uh, that putting a, a pair of hands over your face is going <laughs> to keep you from getting sick. It's crazy it was madness and it was unreality do you know they they even had on the box here cannot prevent infection that should have told us for god's sake and i'll tell you why because everything was issued under and i'm pretty sure you'll have a statute close to it here it was issued under what's called emergency use authorization emergency use authorization has a complete statutory designation. It's an unlicensed, unapproved product. And it was complete fraudulent misrepresentation of everyone. Okay, so the rule was the mask went under EU authority too. And the only way that they could sell them in commerce was to tag them that they didn't prevent any disease. And that shows you the amount of social engineering that it takes an indoctrination for people to read it on the box and still put it on their face like it did some. And it's, they're psychologically manipulative uh, sociopaths because they could even get people to believe and regurgitate something as asinine as my mask doesn't protect me, it protects you. And that's how, so the social engineers understood us. if they didn't make that jump for logic, when you read the box, you would you may grasp that it didn't protect you. So what they did was social engineer people to believe it on blind faith that my mask didn't protect me, it protects you. And here, here's the crazy part about blind and ignorant faith. Religious zealotry, unattached from nature and natural law, without fundamental principles of how we interact with one another, when you're in that form of religious zealotry. It doesn't matter what it is. Everything is a religious religion. Whatever inner held conviction you have is your religious belief. It doesn't matter. That's your inner held conviction. It causes you to act and move. When it is irrational, unreasonable, and illogical, you are willing to cause harm to you, yourself, and others around you. And we witnessed that for three, what, three and a half years during COVID. People were not only wanting to harm others and compel them and co coerce them to uh, comply, but they also were wrecking their brains with what is called hypoxia, breathing in their own exhaust. And this is sad because it's a uh, hypoxia causes a reduced brain function. And it hurts when people are so disillusioned with reality that they cannot accept facts 
Yuri Bezmanov has a great deal where he says it doesn't matter when there's when they're psychologically programmed, we can take black and white facts. We can shove it down their throat. Doesn't matter. They are disillusioned with reality and therefore they're going to blindly follow their religious belief. You're so right. We had our government department pushing exactly what you've said, and they did it to great effect. Certainly 90% um, of the population here went along with it. We had a group called SAGE, which were the scientific advisory group leading the so-called health pandemic. But when you look deeper into it, it was led by a behavioral psychologist, a Professor Susan Mitchie, who is a fully paid up member of the Communist Party. It's all there on Google. They don't hide it. I would say, look, if there's a health pandemic, why are a team, why is the government response being led by a team of behavioral psychologists? What the hell do they have to do with disease control? But again, like you say, people couldn't see it. The rational mind had gone. Yes. And there's a great quote from Ayn Rand. I'm trying to think of it right now. Ask yourself whether any of it would be possible if men had not accepted the idea that man is a sacrificial animal to be immolated for the sake, or I think it's sake, or maybe the guise of public good or public health. It doesn't matter because the abstract is quote unquote, public good, public health, general welfare. The truth is that that only the individuals are here, right? The abstraction is this guise of public health, public good, okay? But in a collective society, such as when Charles Hegel articulated, and so did Nietzsche, and so did many others, that the individual must completely subject himself to the authority of the state because the state is the sovereign. That is contradictory in contradiction to Western ideology. And I'll state it again. There's a reason why Western nations are the ones being infiltrated. It it isn't China. It isn't Cuba. It isn't Ethiopia. It isn't anywhere else. It's only Western countries. And I'll ask each and every one of you out there, which way Western man? Would we like to maintain our freedom and our civil societies that we built? I want to, Uh, I would like my progeny to be free and uh, I would like everyone else's progeny to be free. But the only way we can do this is use objective facts and articulate precisely what's going on at all times and stop being fearful. Really well said. And that actually dovetails into a, a, a question I'd like to put to you in answer to those watching this right now, but we've got a, we've got a diverse audience. There are some that are more experienced than others. And this is more directed to those that are just getting into this now. Having learned what you've learned, going back to the beginning, is there anything you would have done differently that you could perhaps advise those that are now starting on this journey? No, I wish there were people like me, Alphonse, and there's a plethora of different people, the YouTube and things of that, that, that manner. It's not the Wild West anymore, and people can really dial in, especially on X. X is a good platform right now. It's not the be- it's not completely free, but the ideas are finally getting out there without being washed away. If I could change anything, it would be to do what I've done to, for my children, which is start them off in classical liberal education, which is grammar, rhetoric, and logic. The problem is that Johnny can't read. And, I, and this is a quote from Thomas Sowell, and I'll try to get it. I may butcher this one too. Excuse me, guys. I'll try to remember this stuff from the top of my head. It's Johnny can't think because he's never been taught how to think. And, and when you're in that position, and most of us are going through the public education systems, we must remember that the, the overall goal of public education has been from its onset from the rock, especially in the United States, from Rockefeller to the creation of the Department of Education was to create a standardized citizenry who could bypass their uh, cognitive functions and just push buttons and just pull levers. And then going into the 60s with Paulo Freire and things of that nature, it went to the cultural Marxist and the infiltration of all academia where reading, writing, and arithmetic wasn't the goal. Paulo Freire 
who's one of these intellectual geniuses is how they think he is. The goal was to create social activists. And why is that? Because if you can read, write, use logic and reason, you're going to see the fallacy in all their bull crap, right? It, it, and it we'll just give one, one thing. They're trying to cram down our throats right now that a, a woman can be a man and a man can be woman. This is completely arbitrary and capricious behavior. Let's remove the word arbitrary. This complete illogical, unreasonable uh, nonsense because it can't happen. It's an impossibility. And yet they want you to join them in their delusions. And if you don't, here comes the hammer, right? But we can count this across all spectrums. They want to conquer, divide, and use problem action solution, which is the Hegelian dialectic, to keep us chasing our tails. But, and here's the beautiful thing about it. You don't have to get lost in it. You don't have to pick up the dialectical stick. Objective facts that you can reasonably infer things, right? We, facts are facts. And no matter, they're stubborn things. If we stick with objectivity in our natural world and we use this wonderful tool, God gave us mind and speech. We can use this wonderful tool, which is our mouth, in all kind of biblical language about the power and disorder of your mouth, right? We can convey ideas that are not in the land of delusion. They, they can objectively be proven we can logically deduce and we can say, we don't have to be nice about it. You're crazy. <laughs> exactly that. <laughs> the truth resonates, doesn't it? The truth <laughs> resonates. No, Do you have any other questions, Damien? Oh, I'm thoroughly enjoying this. And Brandon's quite right. It reminds me, of, I, I, had a, I had that very conversation. I'll, I'll tell you both in the library today. I'm currently homeschooling my nine-year-old. And, and I just happen to have a, it's having the, the kindness of strangers and having the conversations with strangers. And this woman and I, she was listening to a conversation I was having with my son about exactly what Brandon's just said about this, this ridiculous notion that they could convince people that up is down is up, boys can be girls and vice versa. And they can't get past the simple chromosomal fact that you're either XX or XY chromosome. That's it. That is a foundation of truth. It is solid. They can't get past that. And this woman felt very emboldened by what I had said. She said, I, I, was, I was overhearing that conversation. I'm so glad you've said that because I think the world's going mad. I said, you need to turn your TV off. I said, do not get drawn in. To, uh, to the madness. I said, at the end of the day, I said, you've only got to walk out into nature and there you have God's creation. You've got reality right there. And she said, what you said with regards to the, with the chromosome, she said, I'd never given that a thought. I said, they're trying to pull you away from that fact with this gender ideology that you could have 79 genders, that you can have this. And I said, it's not reality. It's not based on reality. And they're trying to get you to accept the unacceptable. Because when you accept that, you will accept anything. Yes. It, I want to pound this into the heads of people. What they are doing is not equal opportunity. Okay. They're forcing equal outcomes. And this is what equity is. And equity, very simply put, is lowering the standards to the lowest common denominator. That's equity in action. We must, because mental illness, right, it must be praised or something. But if everybody's mentally ill, then we have no sound mind, sound bodies, and a good life. Common sense dictates, folks, we've heard this our whole lives. Common sense isn't that common. It needs to become uncommon again, okay? Common sense dictates that if we affirm people in their mental uh, illness and delusions, that's not good for people. If you can affirm somebody in their victim or guilt consciousness, you create a psychopath, okay? It, this is just common sense. We're, we're supposed to overcome our obstacles and difficulties, and that's the whole purpose of life anyway, because without obstacles and difficulties, you'd never grow, right? You'd never mature. And if you never mature, you're, you're in what's called suspended adolescence. And that's where 
a, a, a large swath of our population is they're stuck in that tween years where you don't really know what's going on and they stay stuck there. We've got grandmas, great grandmothers stuck in suspended adolescence and the filth and depravity coming out of these people are just contrary to logic, reasonable and, and the necessity, this is necessary. So without morals and ethics that can, without these two, your politics are going to be dirty. Okay. Because without morals and ethics, the people don't keep the politicians in place. And so the goal is to continually feed you degeneracies drip by drip. Right. And so that we saw it, it's called incrementalism, by the way. However, we're at the, we're at the point where incrementalism doesn't work. It, you, you have to shove it down the throat because people are saying, oh man, this might be crazy. But anyway, they've done that to, for us to accept that degeneracy is okay. And that trans people are women and all the stuff. Look, what you do in your bedroom is your personal business. It doesn't bother me, but make no mistake. I do not have to use your personal dictionary to walk around and, and speak to people. If it's that offensive for you, you just stay home. <laughs> it's really right. It's actually right. It's, as I say, the truth resonates, right? Do, do you have any more questions, Damien? It, it's just amazing. We are all seeing so clearly now the true face of evil. It's a worldwide establishment an order and it's amazing that we're sat here talking to our friend from uh, are you louisiana yes i'm in louisiana so you're in louisiana i'm up in the north of england gavin's in the south of england basically we're seeing the same thing and the same thing is happening here that's happening in the states but make no mistake about that it's exactly the same playbook yes i've got a question actually just to dovetail this chaotic situation we all find ourselves in back into the law in that this all this stuff's being intentionally done and we know that and it's it, at the moment you can see the end destination if it's, if it's allowed to continue it's not great how do you feel that subversion is occurring in the law did you see that, that it, it's they, they're going to they're, over here they're doing it now so it's very cool. oh yes do you see yes, that um... the law is going to become a mechanism that is no longer able to be used because of the tyranny that's being unleashed how do you see things going over there if we do not so i think we are at a pivotal uh, point in time for instance I, I don't know if you guys saw it the oral arguments in a huge case here uh in the united states which is called murphy versus biden which is the government coming in and uh delete and blocking people on all the internet websites and everything else okay they had oral arguments the other day and Kataja Jack Jackson, which is very co controversial Supreme Court nominee, actually stated in her questioning of the attorney, a complete communist line. She stated that the government with a compelling state interest should be able to restrict all speech and expression. Wow. This is a Supreme Court judge. Okay. And she wanted to know why that the government couldn't restrict speech with a compelling state interest. The, the reason for that, Kintaja Jackson and the Louisiana Solicitor in, uh, General stated unequivocally, that's the very purpose of the First Amendment is to limit government. Make no mistake, there's two different types of judges. Unfortunately, all six of our cases, we have judicial activists. That's just the way it is. We've got to understand where we are. We've got a few people that have good judges and they're winning their cases. The, we've got three appeals in right now. And here's the thing. Don't give up. Do not give up. Use logical deduction. Stack your pleadings. Always object, but use logic, reasoning, and then the rules of interpretation and correct legal dedu logical deduction. And walk it all the way up. I'm willing to pay thousands and thousands of dollars to walk this all the way, every single one of my cases to the Supreme Court, because there's no doubt in my mind that everything that was done during COVID and against my property was a violation of my fundamental liberties, my right to property in one of the cases, right to property in all five cases, because uh, make no mistake about this, uh, people. 
this is a fundamental pr uh, um, principle to you. No one on this earth has the right to your vessel. Okay. No one. This is your property. Okay. And for someone else, an independent third party, to tell you, physically compel you or coerce you into putting a something on, in, or around your body that can't be taken off is a criminal action. Anytime force is introduced, which is physical compulsion, compulsion or coercion, there's a criminal act involved. And if we can understand that fundamentals, we, we can move forward. However, go, getting back to the judicial activists are those activists like Kentaja Jackson who pontificate their own interpretations of the law and what it's supposed to mean for them. They're in every nation on earth. However, the only thing we can do is stay to objectivity and continue harrowing them. And we have to, because if we don't, we, let, we, we lose everything uh, worthwhile and good. And the, one of the last, I'd rather win by the pen then win by the sword later or lose by the sword later. That's not what I want. I want us to be able to continue forward in a civil civil society and let uh, reason win the day. That's my hope. That's what I stay with at all times. But yes, you're correct, Gavin. They have infiltrated every institution in all of our systems. Yeah, very much. But I think you're, you're right. It, we, we can only do what we're doing is I'll just keep moving, keep going forward and don't give up. That's certainly the mantra that we've got here. And, and actually just the message for, because you've, you've just mentioned it there, because there are people that, that they think, let's go and do it. They do their first case and they lose. And there's a number of reasons why they lose, but you've just been saying it. And this is the message I think we should be giving out is, is that's not the end. It doesn't mean anything. It's just, you lost that situation. Analyze it, understand the facts, keep going. Like you say, you've got appeals. You can, even over here, we can go to the Supreme Court. We can go into the European courts. It's like, you don't stop. It's the stopping and the giving up that for me allows them to get their, well, what they're doing, like for them to win, for them to succeed. And it's people like us that are standing in the way of that, using the system and the courts. Yeah. And, and what does righteousness have with Belial, right? Either you're right or you're wrong. And look, the one thing people need to understand, the entirety of our system of law is to protect us from the criminals and government. That's what individualistic system is built upon anyway, to protect the individual, which is the most minute more minority, all, all these groups. Let me show you how hypocritical they are. Minority this, minority that. The, the, the most minuscule minority on, on earth is the individual. And yet they don't want to protect individual rights, okay? They want to protect class rights and group rights and gender rights and everything else because they're secular humanists in the first place. But with that said, with that said, we are on the moral high ground and we cannot give it up. I think that is the perfect way to end this. That's the perfect statement to end it. It is brilliant. Brandon, thank you very much. Brandon, I agree with that because if we give it up, we're giving a piece of our soul away. It's such a pleasure to, to speak with you and, and thank you for sharing your, your intellect and your wisdom. All right, brothers. Hey, man, it was an awesome chat, guys. Uh, Brilliant. Uh, I'll see y'all again soon. Okay, Dave, Damien Real. and Gavin. Hey, thank really, thank you. Have a great day, Ed, and uh, we'll see you soon. Y'all too, guys. Be blessed now. Yeah, God, God, bless. Bless. God bless you. God bless you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Do you find the legal system overwhelming and wish you had the knowledge and skill sets to control judges, persuade attorneys, and win your case? Well, look no further. Sovereign Empowerment is proud to announce our partnership with Dr. Frederick Graves so that we can bring you the Jurisdictionary Law Course, How to Win in Court, your ultimate resource for mastering the courtroom. Unlock powerful case-winning strategies as you learn to control judges like never before. This comprehensive course eliminates guesswork and empowers you to navigate the legal landscape with absolute confidence. With step-by-step -step instructions, flowcharts, and outlines, you'll have all the tools you need to persuade and control judges in any case or court. Learn from a seasoned attorney with over 40 years of winning experience who has distilled his expertise into this comprehensive program. Access everything you need in one single package, including sample forms, video seminars, audio clips, and in-depth case-winning classes. Learn at your own pace, anytime, anywhere. Our 24-7 online access allows you to tailor your learning experience to fit 
fit your schedule. Access the course on your smartphone, tablet, or computer and become a legal master whenever and wherever you want. Benefit from a suite of powerful tools, including a free online legal research tool, a legal dictionary with common sense definitions, and an exclusive Q&A forum to connect with fellow students and obtain expert guidance. Good people have suffered too long at the hands of power because they just didn't know how to fight back. Now, in a matter of just a few days, you can acquire the tools and knowledge that takes law students years to achieve. Can't afford a lawyer? No problem. With the Jurisdictionary Law course, you'll gain the skills to win your case without expensive legal representation. Alternatively, equip your own legal consult with the tools and tactics to fight effectively on your behalf. Level the playing field and secure your victory. No matter what court, civil or criminal, conquer any courtroom challenge with ease. The step-by-step guidance ensures a quick and straightforward learning experience, empowering you to navigate the legal system with bulletproof confidence. As a testament to your newfound legal expertise, you'll have the opportunity to complete a final exam and receive an honorary law degree upon successful completion of the course. Showcase your achievement and establish yourself as a force to be reckoned with in the legal arena. Dr. Graves believes everyone deserves access to legal knowledge. That's why we offer the Jurisdictionary Law Course at an unbeatable price. For less than the cost of a one-hour legal consultation, you'll gain unlimited access to this complete program for up to two full years. Take control of your legal battles without breaking the bank. How to Win in Court has become the most trusted law course worldwide since 1997. Don't miss out on this exclusive opportunity to gain the upper hand in the courtroom. Enroll in the official Jurisdictionary Law Course today and unleash your legal power. Click the link in the description below to become legally empowered today.